eh, buenos días a todos, la lingua española y la lingua que nessuno ha parlato. Uh, I am not a theologian. I am a sociologist who tries to understand and study the changing role and place of religions in contemporary global societies. And what I'm going to try to do today is to present what I consider to be the social conditions of possibility for this meeting that we are having today. It would have been unthinkable a meeting like this one 70 years ago, and even 50 years ago when PSI started in Rome. So what has happened that has brought us all together in this room? In my presentation, I would like to proceed in three steps. First, I'm going to offer a schematic outline of the global historical process of transformation from the old system of discrimination between true and false religion to the contemporary system of increasing religious pluralism and interreligious mutual recognition. Then I'm going to analyze two different conditions of religious education and two different types of impact which they imply, namely, I'm going to distinguish between, on the one hand, the socio-political impact of teaching and understanding the religion of the other in public schools and state educational institutions, and on the other hand, the socio-cultural and interreligious impact of teaching and understanding the religion of the other in private schools and religious educational institutions. So, first, from monotheistic, monopolistic religious regimes to a global secular system of religious pluralism. We, by which I mean global humanity, have been moving since World War II, and particularly in the last 50 years, from systems of monotheistic or monopolistic religious regimes based on the discriminatory distinction between true and false religion, or orthodoxy and heterodoxy, to a global secular system of religious pluralism based on three interrelated principles. First, the principle of individual religious freedom. Second, the principle of a secular state that protects religious freedom and religious diversity. And third, the recognition of religious pluralism as a positive manifestation of the global human condition. Presently, we find ourselves in a transitional phase. At the global level, all societies and all religions are or have been moving in such a direction, but moving unevenly at different speeds and propelled by different dynamics. In order to illustrate the transition, let me quote from the response of Pope Francis on the flight from Colombo to Manila last week to the journalist who reminded him that, quote, not so long ago, at the end of the 20th century, missionaries used to say that Buddhism is a demonic religion. Pope Francis retorted, not only Buddhists were going to hell, Protestants also. When I was a child, 70 years ago, all Protestants were going to hell. That's what we were told in catechesis. But I believe that the Church has grown greatly in the knowledge and respect of other religions." End of quote. As a sociologist, rather than as a theologian, I would like to sketch the two parallel roads which, on the global level, have made possible the long historical transition from a condition of discrimination and rejection of the religious other to a condition of recognition and respect. In the case of the Christian West, at least since the Constantinian establishment of Christianity, the Christian religious regime had been based on the fundamental doctrinal distinction between true and false religion. This is the faithful mosaic distinction introduced for the first time in the history of humanity by monotheism, a distinction which is shared by all three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. 
the Christian system was based on the distinction between the Catholic faith as the vera religio, this was the title of St. Augustine's book, the vera religione, while all the other false religions became differentiated into the various categories of Christian schismatics and heretics, Jewish and Muslim infidels, and idolatrous pagans. The distinction between true and false religion was translated into the slogan, error has no rights, only truth has rights, including the right to be imposed coercively by the spiritual and temporal powers alike. The same logic was expressed in the principle of the Westphalian system, cuius regio eius religio, a formula that put an end to the wars of religion of modern early state formation after the Protestant Reformation. The formula gave the royal sovereign the authority to impose religious confessionalization in his realm. As a result, Northern Europe became homogeneously Protestant, Southern Europe became homogeneously Catholic, with three biconfessional societies in between, Holland, Germany, and Switzerland. The contemporary secular system of global religious pluralism has emerged as the complex outcome of two parallel and interrelated historical processes. The process of state secularization and deconfessionalization in the West and the process of intercultural and interreligious encounters that began with the European global colonial expansion in the 16th century and the accompanying global Catholic missions. In Western Europe, the principle of religious toleration began to emerge first slowly throughout the 18th century, proposed simultaneously by secular Enlightenment thinkers and by secular utilitarian rulers in such Protestant countries as England, Holland, and Prussia. Both were expressions of a repulsive reaction against the religious wars of the previous century. Pope Francis himself made expressive reference to this dynamic in the both mentioned conversation when he said, quote, one should not offend, make war, or kill in the name of one's own religion or in the name of God. But let's think about our own history. How many wars of religion have we had? Remember St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. We've been also sinners in this respect. One should not kill in the name of God. It is an aberration. End of quote. Every early modern European state was a confessional state, Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran, Calvinist, or Orthodox. The process of state secularization in Europe has entailed a process of deconfessionalization, which has exhibited three main variants. There is first the French laicist pattern of hostile disestablishment through a confrontational break with the Catholic Church. There is secondly, the pattern of gradual secularization and deconfessionalization of the state through the expansion of toleration to all religious minorities while maintaining the privileged establishment of the national church. This is the pattern exhibited by Anglican England and Nordic Lutheran countries. Finally, there is the pattern of negotiated deconfessionalization of the state and disestablishment of the church while maintaining corporatist relations between the state and the national church or churches. This is the pattern one finds in biconfessional Germany and Holland, as well as in various Catholic countries by means of concordats. The other road of external colonial religious encounters does not lead so much to secularization, but rather to the expansion of religious pluralism through a complex dynamics dynamic of conflict and competition between Christian and non-Christian religions and cultures. The United States has always served as one of the paradigmatic models of religious pluralism. Following the American Revolution, the sectarian principle, sectarian principle of religious freedom became institutionalized in the dual clause of the First Amendment that prohibited any form of religious establishment while protecting the free exercise of religion in society. 
a new system of religious pluralism, that of American denominationalism, emerged in the United States based on the principle of formal equality of all denominations before the law, a principle which tended to undermine the traditional European distinction between church and sect, as well as that between orthodoxy and heterodoxy. The key, key principle of the Christian regime, that is the distinction between true and false religion, thus became also undermined. Following the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations after World War II, it is the threefold American model of individual religious freedom, of a secular state that protects the free exercise of religion in society, and of pluralist denominationalism that has been gaining ground on the global stage rather than the European lazy secularist model. Paradoxically, the expansion of the global secular system brings in its wake not homogeneous secularization, as European sociological theories of modernity and secularization had predicted, but rather diverse dynamics of religious revival and especially of increasing religious pluralization throughout the globe. The key principle of the new global secular trend is the recognition of religious freedom as an inalienable individual right based on the sacred dignity of the human person. Not creeds or doctrines, but persons have rights. In this respect, and this is what is radically new, neither truth nor error have rights per se. Persons have the right and the duty to search the truth without coercion and to follow their conscience in good faith. The second key component is the principle of a newly redefined secular state. The modern state needs to be secular, but not in the lazy or secularist sense of adopting a critical negative attitude towards religion, preserving for itself the right to regulate religion and to keep it in its place, excluding it from the public sphere. The, st the state needs to be secular precisely out of respect for the freedom of religion of each and all its citizens. The third foundational principle is the recognition of a fundamental sociological fact of our global age, the recognition that global humanity is characterized by an irremediable religious and cultural plurality. This recognition, in turn, leads to the acknowledgement that religious pluralism, rather than being a negative fact that needs to be corrected and suppressed, is a positive principle that calls all religious communities to mutual respect and recognition, indeed, to interreligious dialogue. But although the expansion of the three interrelated principles of individual religious freedom, a neutral secular state, and interreligious pluralism, may be the most significant global trend of the last 50 years. It does not mean that such a novel trend is being institutionalized everywhere in the same way or is accepted always without resistance. On the contrary, we also see in many parts of the world open and at times violent opposition to each of the principles. Throughout much of the world of Islam, much of the world of Islam, not everywhere, for instance, one still finds much resistance to all three principles. Many Muslim societies still function with a crucial distinction between true and false religion and use discriminatory distinctions between true Orthodox Islam, or Sunnah, and schismatic Shiite, heretic Ahmadiyyas and Baha'is, Muslims, infidels, Christian and Jews, and idolatrous pagans. Notwithstanding the existence of a rich religious pluralism in China, the Chinese state, with its millennial tradition of Cesar or Papist prerogative of defining orthodoxy and heterodoxy, represents today one of the most outspoken forms of resistance to the new global trend. Russia represents a different form of resistance to the principle of religious freedom as manifested in the alliance of an imperial secular authoritarian state and the Russian Orthodox Church, which through the Moscow Patriarchate maintains its canonical territorial claims over many 
of the newly independent states of the former Soviet Union. But even long-standing European democracies, which at least in their constitutions already recognize the principle of religious freedom, have had to adjust in the last decades their traditional patterns of church-state relations in response to the growth of religious pluralism. All European states have been compelled to reassess their patterns of church-state relations either because they were still too confessional, privileging the national majority religion over other minority relig religions, as has been the case in the Lutheran Nordic countries, or because their insistence on a lay public sphere free from religion tended to discriminate against all religions' citizens. It is this reflexive recognition that has led influential European thinkers, such as Jürgen Habermas, to recognize the legitimate role of religion in the public sphere and to speak of post-secular societies. My second point, the socio-political implications of religious pluralism, religious education in public schools. Naturally, this global transformation has important socio-political and socio-cultural implications for religious education in public schools as well as in religious schools. Recognizing the principle of religious freedom and freedom of conscience as an inalienable individual right implies that every individual has a right to religious education. But at the same time, it implies that religious education cannot be imposed or coerced and has to be organized so as to respect the freedom of conscience of each and every individual. The principle of a secular state that protects the religious freedom and the increasing religious pluralization of its citizens implies that ideally the state ought to become post-secularist and post-Westphalian. That means that the state should no longer dictate the religion of its citizens, cuius regio eius religio, either promoting an established national religion that discriminates against other minority religions or promoting a secular civil religion that discriminates against all religions. Rather, the state should strive to maintain a certain equitable distance and respect towards all religions as well as towards non-believers. How this ideal norm is to become actualized in the very different socio-political, socio-cultural and religious context of each particular society is a practical question that demands much consensual deliberative judgment as well as a pragmatic response. How in any particular socio-historical context religious education is to be institutionalized, whether in and through public schools or in and through religious schools or through some combination of both is a practical question which should be addressed pragmatically and having into account given historical and cultural traditions. There is no abstract ideal model that could or should be implemented in all societies without regard to particular contexts. It would not be possible in today's presentation to analyze the many different variants of religious education one finds even throughout the Western world. As an illustration, let me simply sketch briefly the three mentioned European patterns of state secularization along with the North American one in order to ascertain the way in which they may need to readjust their system of public education in order to incorporate the religions of the other. On the one extreme stand strict secular states like France and the United States that maintain a rigid non-establishment and some kind of wall of separation between a state and religion. On the other extreme stand those states which are still confessional or at least maintain some form of religious establishment. In between, one finds, one finds secular states in multi-confessional societies such as Germany which maintain corporatist relations with the various churches or religious communities. Both France and the United States have established secular public school systems that prohibit religious education. But the rationale for this prohibition is very different in both cases. 
in the case of France, public laic education was organized in hostile competition with the National Catholic Church, which as mater et magistra had been the main provider of education during the ancient regime. After the French Revolution, the state took over educa educational institutions in a way attempting to replace the church as pater et magister. When it comes to religious education, the wall of separation in the US is even more rigid than in France, since not only is religious education in public schools unconstitutional, but so is the public funding of religious education. The rationale, however, is not so much the creation of a secular public sphere free from religion, since religion in the US is generally viewed positively, but to avoid the state privileging any particular religion that would discriminate against religious minorities. Indeed, despite a pronounced and lasting anti-Catholic nativism that was particularly adamant against the use of public funding for private Catholic schools, the constitutional principle of free exercise of religion allowed the building of an extensive system of private Catholic education at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels at the university that in many places successfully competed with the public school system. Other religious immigrant minorities, including Muslims, have the same constitutional protection as Catholics to develop their own private school system. I cannot discuss here with the same detail the dynamics of transformation of the system of religious education in other Western countries, which either still have some kind of formal religious establishment, as is the case of Anglican England, the Nordic Lutheran countries, or Orthodox Greece, or which publicly maintain or subsidize some kind of multi-confessional educational institutions, as is the case of formerly secular states, such as Catholic Austria, Belgium, Italy, or Spain, or by confessional ones like Germany and the Netherlands. But it should be obvious that the main socio-political challenge of all these countries face is how to minimize, if not to eliminate, the discriminatory privileges still enjoyed by the officially recognized church or churches, while extending similarly equitable treatment to the new religious minorities, particularly to Islam. Finally, uh, I come to my concluding uh, notes. So far, I have been only discussing the different ways in which different countries administer, regulate, or facilitate the religious education, that is, the religious indoctrination of their citizens in their own religious traditions. But equally significant and interesting are the ways in which the increase of religious pluralization, both at the national and particularly at the global level, demand that public schools, as well as private and religious educational institutions, also engage in the transmission of knowledge and understanding of diverse religious traditions, so that believers and non-believers learn to understand the religious traditions of the other in a way that it may facilitate and foster interreligious understanding and dialogue. I have very little to add to what has already been said so eloquently the last two days about the teaching and understanding of Islam in Christian schools and the teaching and understanding of Christianity in Muslim schools. Such an analysis could be extended to interreligious understanding and dialogue between all the religious traditions. I would like to conclude with just a few remarks about the experience of interreligious and intercultural dialogue pioneered by the Society of Jesus in the early modern era of global cultural encounters. As pioneer global missionaries and as pioneer global educators, the Jesuits left a rich legacy of interreligious and intercultural encounters which illuminate some of the achievements, possibilities, and also difficulties which we are still confronting today. 
the Jesuit Catholic missionary impulse have naturally as a matter of course the hegemonic purpose of universal conversion to the true Catholic faith. In this respect, the Jesuits never challenged the discriminatory distinction between true and false religion. But what makes Jesuit global missionary practices particularly relevant today is the fact that under certain circumstances, their controversial method of accommodation took a form which we would call today nativist enculturation. This is the famous and controversial formula of Jesuit cultural accommodation which led to the adoption of the Confucian, Confucian habitus in China by Matteo Ricci, the Brahmin habitus in India by Roberto de Nobili, the Guarani habitus in the Reducciones de Paraguay, but also the for us today less commendable accommodating habitus of slave owners in the Jesuit plantations in Brazil or Maryland. It entailed a formula of globalization of Christianity through the particularization of the universal by going local or native through a process of reflexive enculturation and acculturation which theologically amounts to a formula of ever renewed Christian incarnation. The fact that the method was so vehemently attacked by the other missionary orders and even by other Jesuits in India and China before, before it exploded into the Chinese and Malabar rights controversy in Rome and Paris indicates the extent to which challenge Eurocentric notions of uniform Roman Catholic globalization. Thank you very much for your attention.